I'm thrilled to open the 24th anniversary of this very special lecture. The Evelyn McNeil Sims Native Plant Lecture was established in the spring of 2000 through a gift by North Carolina Botanical Garden Honorary Director Nancy Preston as a way to honor her mother, Evelyn McNeil Sims, for her 90th birthday. Some, a little history about Evelyn McNeil Sims. We'll see if I can get this right. Okay. Um, she, was, she was born in Lumberton, North Carolina, and educated at the Women's College, now called UNC Greensboro. After graduation, she moved to Kingsport, Tennessee, with her young family, where she was very active in the Bays Mountain Park Association. One of her favorite activities involved wildflower excursions in the mountains surrounding Kingsport. Now, Evelyn McNeil Sims also uh, contributed greatly to this facility, the Allen Education Center. Uh, she gave some money to support the breezeway that connects this Reeves Auditorium to the Peg Exhibit Hall, and she named it in honor of her family. She calls it the Sims Preston Breezeway. Not the Sims Preston Breezeway, the Sims <laughs> Preston Breezeway. <laughs> So this lecture series happens every spring and showcases native plants, their cultivation, conservation, and or ecology. These subjects are especially appropriate because Evelyn McNeil Sims loved botanical exp explorations, especially in, this, in the spring when wildflowers emerged. Now she attended many lectures like this at the North Carolina Botanical Garden with friends and families well past when she was 100 years old. Um, in 2016, after she passed away at the age of 104, Nancy and Ed Preston established a permanent endowment to ensure the North Carolina Botanical Garden can always offer this free public lecture each year. Now, this table that David has put up on the screen showcases the many impressive botanists, naturalists, authors, gardeners who have addressed this lecture over the last 24 years. And today we're gonna to add Bill Finch to that list. So it's great to have Bill here with us today. I had a chance to speak with him just this afternoon and we're thrilled to have him provide the 24th annual Evelyn McNeil Sims Native Plant Lecture. Now Bill is director of the Paint Rock Forest Research Center, a 4,000 acre nonprofit research facility operating coordination with the Nature Conservancy and multiple universities in Alabama. Bill has worked in and wrote about southern ecosystems for decades as an award-winning environmental editor and journalist and as the conservation director of the Nature Conservancy of Alabama and director of Mobile Botanical Gardens. Now his book, Longleaf Far as the Eye Can See, was developed with the Longleaf Alliance and photographer Beth May Maynor Young, who later became his wife. And it is now in its fourth printing with UNC Press. So we're thrilled to have Bill with us today. Bill, come on up and um, tell, us, tell us all about the Longleaf. So I have to uh, talk about a subject that uh, have to be careful when I say it anymore. In fact, every time I talk about this now, I am sure to ask the sponsors, what is the legislation in your state doing right now when it comes to how we talk about diversity? Boy, I grew up in the South. I would have thought by this time, and yet here we are. <laughs> We still have a really hard time talking about diversity. We have a hard time understanding diversity. You know, every time uh, it interests me, I worked a lot with E.O. Wilson, uh, the great scientist, biologist, evolutionary biologist. And, and Ed wrote a lot about diversity and how important it was. He coined a lot of terms and I, and Ed, Ed believed that everybody in their soul and fundamentally should enjoy diversity, that it should be important to them. And yet, I have to admit, 
And I've often said to Ed, people are scared to death of diversity. They have a very hard time with it. And it works in so many ways. My, you know, people who, my wife is always saying, now keep it simple. <laughs> Don't overwhelm them. If I'm going to talk about diversity, the message I can want you to take away from it, the simple message I want you to take away is that diversity is not simple. <laughs> it's not simplistic. We have to, it's challenging. The other thing I want you to know is I plan to just completely, totally overwhelm you. I hope I do, because that's the adventure of diversity. That's what's exciting about diversity. It's overwhelming. It's new. It's surprising. It's our future. Longleaf is a meditation in diversity. And, and I think about this more and more. It's diverse in ways that we never consider. Diverse in ways that I never considered. I'm old enough now, Julie, to admit to some of my mistakes. <laughs> Julie has seen some of them. Uh, and, and some of my mistakes were not to really understand what an incredibly diverse forest Longleaf is, and how it inspires, if you will, inflames, if you will, diversity in other ecosystems throughout the South. And uh, it's interesting. So this is, this is theme and variations, meditations on diversity in Longleaf. Uh, I have to, some of the pictures here, some are from other folks. I have to credit my wife. <laughs> really done a great job with these pictures. Uh, she lets me borrow them on occasion. Uh, that great longleaf forest, I, I, um, while we're talking about this, uh, because I'm going to have to come back to it a lot, I hope that you get all tangled up when I talk about diversity. I hope you don't know which diversity I'm talking about, <laughs> because that's the way we need to understand diversity. From an ecosystem standpoint, we're going to talk about diversity at the ecosystem level, even within Longleaf. We're going to talk about it at the species level, and then I'm going to talk about something that you're probably not used to thinking about, but you're going to have to start thinking about it if you love Longleaf and if you love forest. It's genetic diversity, and that's not just species diversity. It's really important. And we're going to have to think about human diversity at the same time. Human diversity is not the same as biological diversity exactly. But you know, there is only one human species. But there's, an interesting, there's some interesting things to learn if we understand biological diversity about human diversity and vice versa. OK, that's the, that's the topper. Lot of diversity in Longleaf. Uh, one of the things I, I really need to help you understand more than anything else, and you'll see it a lot in these photographs, is that Longleaf is a conductor of light, and that has been one of its great glories. It is. It knows how to use light better than almost any other forest system. And, and my wife's photographs capture it really well. I just, uh, an aside, if you go in a longleaf forest, I'm always amazed at this. It's like the light is coming up out of the ground. It's just bizarre. It's an amazing feature of longleaf. And you don't see it in many other forests. And we're going we're gonna to look at that in just a little bit and, and the implications of that. But let's do a kind of a catalog of the, sh of the ships here. Diversity in Longleaf, I'm going to go through this very quickly because, again, my, my, my job here is to overwhelm you. So uh, we're going to look at, this is picture of lamp box, this incredible diversity. These are some areas where the species diversity is on the order of 40, 50, and, and sometimes 60 species per square meter. Extraordinary diversity. This is Splinter Hill, pitcher plant bog in Alabama. Really extraordinary place. Uh, you know, the, uh, 
One of the great glories of Longleaf is that it is, it is the great center of carnivorous plant diversity in North America and, uh, and the center of Saracenia diversity globally, of, of uh, terrestrial pitcher plants globally. Uh, beautiful images of all of these different Saracenias, their flowers, the pitcher plants, extraordinary things, maw and paw pitcher plant. Uh, the purple pitcher plant, which we now know is a couple of different species. Uh, uh, this, is, uh, <laughs> this is a species that almost got lost. This is Wary's pitcher plant, the copper top pitcher plant. Uh, one of the, uh, as we learn more and more about the longleaf forest, we're finding that, oh, well, diversity really is complicated, isn't it? There are a lot of species that we didn't really acknowledge until recently. Orchids of all types, lilies, I'm not going to let you dwell on any of this for very long. Uh, legumes, uh, beans, uh, members of the bean family. It's just a huge diversity of legumes in longleaf. This is butterfly pea, uh, the mints, dicerandra, uh, mints you've never heard of. <laughs> it's one of the great glories of longleaf. These incredible mints, very fragrant. Some of them you can smell from a distance. They're so fragrant. Dicerandra is one of those, really a strong, I left one on my dashboard and it smelled up my car for weeks. <laughs> uh, and and things, things we don't talk about that are the great glories of the South, uh, Sabadia. Rose pinks is the name we give it, um, S-A-B-A-T-I-A. -A -A. We're not going to call it Sabatia because that sounds like a cyst. <laughs> uh, it's Sabadia. And a, a beautiful thing, all kinds of sabadias that are native to uh, longleaf. America is the center of sunflower diversity. It's, uh, we're in the midst of Ukraine now, and, and everybody thinks, oh, God, you, Ukraine must, uh, must be the center of sunflower diversity. Well, it's North America. All sunflowers in the world come from North America, period. Uh, we have exported them to other places like Ukraine. But the center of sunflower diversity globally we never talk about this, is the South. There are 52 species. The South probably has somewhere around 35 or 40 of them. Uh, incredible sunflower diversity that we rarely talk about. A lot of that is in longleaf, uh, along with silphiums and tons of other asters, gentians, beautiful things. Goldcrest lofiola, I have that in here. It's one of my favorite plants. It's actually, it, we now think it's probably more a lily than anything else. We're still trying to figure it out. There's nothing else in its genus. And it's one of these ancient, ancient plants that, has, that tells us something about how old uh, the longleaf forest assembly is, or at least the species within that uh, in the southeast. And the, and the other thing, so these are all beautiful herbaceous plants, and we always talk about the herbaceous plants of longleaf, and we don't talk enough about the shrubs. And one of the reasons we don't talk enough about the shrubs, I think, is because a lot of us are out there trying to get rid of some of those shrubs, because they can take over an ecosystem. But you know, when, I, when, it, when you think about it, and almost nobody writes about this, diversity is complicated. Even though shrubs can can consume a longleaf ecosystem and, and, and lessen its diversity. A lot of the diversity in a longleaf ecosystem is, is shrubs. It, it's got, it is certainly the center of blueberry diversity in North America, the longleaf forest. Incredible numbers of species in the genus Vaccinium and Galusacea. Uh, and we, we're still trying to sort out which one's a Galusacea and which one's a Vaccinium. But there's, I, I didn't count them all, a ton of them. Uh, but then hollies of all types, Father Gillas, uh, Serratiolas, the pine barrens, rosemary, spring and summer tie ties, Lyonias, you, you, the fetter bushes, Leucothes, Zenobia, tar flower, Eliadia, Cassandra, wax myrtles, red base, spice bush, pepper bush, pond spice, azaleas, sassafras, yes, is a shrub in longleaf, uh, Calmia, Pieris, Aronia, Hawthorns, Franklinia. It would be fun to dwell on each of those, but I wanted to overwhelm you because incredible shrub diversity, incredible shrub diversity in longleaf. And that's something we don't talk about enough. Uh, we don't talk about blueberries enough. There's some really cool blueberries out there. Another way of thinking about it, you know, with all these plants, they're not just sitting there by themselves. 
all those pretty flowers were pretty for a reason. And that reason is Longleaf is a great center of insect diversity, of invertebrate diversity, of pollinator diversity. And so I want to talk about one of those because this is the thing everybody else wants to talk about for the time being, monarchs. And we don't think about how important monarchs are to longleaf, and we don't think about how important longleaf is to the survival of monarchs. Longleaf covered somewhere around 90 million to 100 million acres. Huge area. We're going to look at those maps in a minute. Now, we have less than less than 5% of that left, much less than 5% really in terms of a functioning ecosystem. <coughs> Think about the loss of these flowers at that scale and what impact it had on a lot of insects. Now let's look at what happens when you add monarchs to the mix. This is the migration patterns of monarchs. If you look at that, where is that migration going? It's spreading out over the south and the southeast, right through the longleaf belt as it moves northward. Now here's an interesting thing. There they are on the coast. There they are as they move northward. Uh, by the way, a, a, lot of, a lot of monarchs overwinter along the Gulf Coast. Uh, but I think people don't realize that, and it's something we don't write enough about. Asclepius, it's like the Asclepius are there to meet them, the milkweeds. So the longleaf forest is one of the great centers of milkweed diversity. Incredible. 40 native species that, uh, that may be of use to monarchs. 25 to 30 of those are closely associated with the longleaf ecosystem. These are different species. About 15 are endemic, largely restricted to longleaf. I want you to think about that. That was 90 million acres in which Asclepius was really abundant. All these milkweeds. Hmm. Is this part of the missing link in monarchs? Or monarchs? Here's a great map looking at Asclepius diversity, milkweed diversity. And you see that there are two great centers. One is along the, the coastal regions of, of the Gulf Coast and the Carolinas, and the other is out in Kansas. How important was that to the monarchs? I think it was probably pretty important. Just to give you a sense of some of that milkweed diversity, I, I wish I had pictures. I, in fact, I had a pictures of a lot of them, but I just thought this would be enough to kind of give you a sense of that incredible diversity uh, within milkweeds, within the longleaf e ecosystem. And of course, what we do uh, when we want to save monarchs is we go to Brazil and we get an invasive <laughs> milkweed to bring and sell so that we can have monarchs here in the center of milkweed diversity. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about this milkweed because it tells us a lot about how important longleaf was. There was a great study in New York in which they looked at the foods that monarchs had been eating as they moved into New York and in New England. And there were two species that contributed, that, that, that showed up in the chemistry. One was, uh, one was the, the antelope, the, the green um, milkweed, which is fairly common in longleaf ecosystems along the Gulf Coast. And the other one is this longleaf endemic Asclepius humistrata, which has got to be one of the most spectacular foliage plants you've ever seen. No, no plant you will ever grow in your yard will have foliage as spectacular as Asclepius humistrata. And, and this, was, this was huge, playing a huge role in, in the movement of monarchs as they move north. Asclepius humistrata is one of those milkweeds that has just gotten creamed with the loss of longleaf. Just some thoughts about diversity and, and the importance of longleaf to that diversity. Uh, and, and then on the return trip, uh, this incredible uh, display of wildflowers in longleaf in fall uh, is very important. Timing, if we think about milkweeds, we, we ought to time 
uh, the plants we use based on their movements, something to think about longleaf and monarchs. But what do we got? 6,000 vascular plant, more than 6,000 vascular plant species in longleaf, more than 1,600 endemic plant species. We've got places that average, I'm sorry, not 25 to 55, but 25 to 35 species per square meter, more than 60 species per square meter in some places, the size of a beach towel. Probably more than 10,000 species, Bruce Means and some other folks uh, did some work on trying to characterize that, uh, Reed Noss. It's very hard to uh, determine exactly how many invertebrates, arthropods are using that, but it's, it's huge. Some 40 species of amphibians makes the longleaf forest the center of frog diversity in North America which I think is pretty cool, about 60 species of reptiles. That includes snakes, yes. It also includes things like turtles, uh, one of the great centers of turtle diversity. In fact, the Gulf Coast is the center of turtle diversity in the Western Hemisphere, which uh, has a lot to do with longleaf. <coughs> uh, there are 100 or so bird species and about 40 species of mammals now. We should talk about that a little more. But how do you fit all that in? And so I want to talk about how Longleaf manages this diversity, uh, a, a light for all seasons, seasonal diversity. This is a typical forest, or this is, this is a typical wetland forest. This is a cypress forest. It's a very beautiful place, a very spooky place. It's, it's a great, I love it. I love going into those, I love going into those cypress swamps. But look at the diversity. What's on the ground? There is, a, there is a problem about light management and a lot of forest. So not a lot of light falls on the ground in the places where plants can grow. And it's not just cypress forest. Here's a forest that I love very much. It's in the Red Hills of Alabama. It's very much like a montane uh, Appalachian forest, it, a lot of Appalachian forests look this way. It's really beautiful. It's got incredible diversity of oaks and hickories and beech. You can see them all there. And what's on the ground? Nothing. It's a charnel house. It's where leaves decompose. Why is that? There's no light. This is really important. Longleaf is special. Well, let me show you. There is a brief season of light in that forest, and you get this incredible explosion of things like trilliums and other things, uh, and, and it's really beautiful. But it is a brief season of light when those deciduous trees lose their leaves. So when people say to me, though, gosh, what is the season, what is the peak season in a longleaf forest? Because we're used to these forests that have a peak season based on light availability. I say all seasons. Well, except maybe January. There you go. Diversity is stacked. It is seasonally stacked in longleaf. This is really important. And I, it's one of the great discoveries for me in longleaf is, and it really is revelatory in terms of how we manage forest and how we understand those forests, but also in terms of how you manage your garden, by the way. We live in an area with a long growing season. If you get your advice from Boston, which has a very short growing season, you're gonna mess up because everything is very concentrated there. But here in the Carolinas and, and farther south, we have such a long growing season that in a, in a longleaf forest where the light is available all the time, something's blooming all year long, but it's not the same thing that was blooming two months ago. It won't be the same thing that will be, be blooming two months later. Diversity is stacked. There's a little bit of something there that you can use in your garden. It's one way to think about gardens, if you understand that about longleaf. And that's how we get 60 species per square meter in a longleaf forest. Spatial diversity, we, we got to talk about this just a little bit because if we're going to preserve longleaf diversity, we've got to understand that longleaf had a gigantic range. 
And what, we live in the age of Walmart, if I may say so, and Home Depot and Lowe's, where there are 12 plants you can have and grow in your garden. <laughs> and it's got to be the same 12 plants everywhere in the U.S. because that fits their business model, and that's how we're used to thinking about things. But in longleaf, these 6,000 vascular plant species, they don't occur every place in that longleaf forest. They're widely distributed there. So if you save a little piece of longleaf here, you're not saving that diversity. You're only saving a little fraction of that diversity. Let me show you what I mean. This is green swamp. This is, uh, and, and this is in North Carolina, I hope you know. Uh, if you, uh, if that looks as different from uh, the pitcher plant bog that we showed you in Alabama, it should. And the diversity in these two places is extraordinarily different. This thing, Julie's smiling. Venus flytrap. Uh, it's, it is a Carolina endemic. Uh, we forget about that. I, you know, I think it's the coolest plant in the world. I mean, it was the plant that I knew when I was 12 years old and thought it was cool. And I wanted to go to a place where, where that grew. And it didn't grow in Alabama. It only grew in the Carolinas. Now we're kind of messing things up a little bit, moving things around. But it's interesting how much diversity, things like Macranthera, which is a plant that I dearly love, you'll never see it here in the Carolinas. Isn't it spectacular? Patty's Pond, the diversity there is incredibly different from places like the mountains of Alabama, where longleaf climbs literally into the Blue Ridge, in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Incredible diversity there, uh, even within that system, really unusual things um, underneath that forest. This is a longleaf forest. Evelyn, please pay attention in Texas. <laughs> and there's some great longleaf forests in Texas that are as different from the forest in the Carolinas and Alabama as they possibly can be. Uh, and grasses. I, I got to talk a little bit about grasses. So one of the, you know, in, we want to simplify everything. We want to make an easy story to tell. And my job here is to overwhelm you. So I'm going to tell you that the grass diversity in longleaf is extraordinary, and it's not all wiregrass. And everybody says, oh, man, longleaf and wiregrass, longleaf and wiregrass. We got forest in Alabama where there is no wiregrass. And yet the grass diversity is just insane. In fact, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this. Julie can strike me dead. <laughs> The forests that aren't dominated by wire grass actually have more grass diversity. Andropogons, uh, toothache grass, my goodness, goodness gracious, that should be the symbol of longleaf. I, I love toothache grass. It, is, it stretches from the Carolinas all the way back into Mississippi. Do you all know toothache grass? It is, it is one of life's great pleasures, toothache grass. It's not only beautiful, it's the kind of thing you just walk into the forest with your friends and you put it in your mouth and you're just all overwhelmed. Toothache grass, read up about it, it's really cool. But incredible grass diversity, all types of andropogons, oh man, don't get me started. And Georgia asters, in the mountains. This is virtually endemic, beautiful, one of the most beautiful asters around, virtually endemic to longleaf. And Evelyn, please pay attention. Don't you wish you had a flower like that in North Carolina? <laughs> that is from the Texas longleaf. That is a lophia. It is a very, Texas and Louisiana, very highly restricted. And you, you don't see that thing, I don't know what you call it, we're gonna call it a tiger iris, tiger irises, incredibly spectacular things. Again, diversity in longleaf, 
is incredible on, on every level. It's incredible spatially, and it's different in every place. So if we really want to save the diversity of longleaf, and we really want to appreciate it, we have to understand that we have to save it throughout its range. And we have to save even some of the small fractions. I, I And longleaf is diverse because it's inclusive. I want you to think about this really hard. I want you to think about this really well. We're using all the languages we're not supposed to use. It's diverse because it's inclusive. And this is really odd. And I don't think we know enough about longleaf yet. And I, I don't think we've studied this in longleaf enough. Let me show you this. this is, oh, keep this map in your mind. That's the range of longleaf. Now, I'm going to show you another map. Can you see? I get it there? No, I got moved down one floor. You remember that map of longleaf? Now, this is the map of total tree diversity in the United States. The areas with brightest blue and dark blue, those are the areas with really high tree diversity. You notice that there's any overlap here? Boom. Now, here's the thing, one of my early mistakes. I used to emphasize to people a longleaf forest is about nothing but longleaf. It really is hard for people to understand the diversity is on the ground. It's the herbaceous layer that's so important. You know, the diversity of longleaf is about the diversity of all forest and all trees. It's really incredible. And it's not that they all occur in the longleaf forest, but sometimes they do. Let's look at some things. That is a map, if you can see it, of oak diversity. Oak diversity is not where you thought it was. It's not in, the, it's not in Western North Carolina. God bless Western North Carolina. I went to school there. It's not in Western North Carolina. It's not in the mountains. Where's the center of oak diversity? It's in the center of the longleaf forest. By golly, that is amazing. How did that happen? I'm not sure I know <laughs> exactly. But Longleaf supports what is the greatest association of oak species in North America. Endemics and near endemics like Geminata, Lavis, Chapmanii, Pumilia, Pumilla, Minima, Myrtifolia, Margareta, Incana, Inopina, Boyntonii, Georgiana, Arkansana. Frequent fire tolerance associates like blackjack oak, white oak, post oak, southern red oak. And for reasons that I think are very important and that may help to explain why there's so much oak diversity in the center of longleaf, where there are hillsides where there may be 30 species of oaks, literally, in the red hills on the north side of the slopes and the east side of the slopes, and on the south side of the slopes, it's all longleaf. You have to understand the special role that longleaf played in conducting fire into those landscapes and how longleaf, uh, longleaf did that. So I, I got to talk about something else here. Longleaf... There are other pines in longleaf forests. You need to know this. And we've, we've not understood the role of those pines. Longleaf, if you haven't gotten the message yet, it takes a community to create a longleaf forest. And that community is sometimes composed of other pines. So one of the great forests that we, we've lost is this coastal forest uh, in Florida, and I think into Carolina as well, uh, into the South Carolina, uh, certainly into parts of Georgia, of, and along Alabama and into Texas, of the slash pine forest, an incredible forest. It wasn't nearly as extensive as longleaf, but it occupied areas that longleaf didn't occupy very well and helped to create a contiguous zone of diversity in a longleaf forest. It was uh, Carrie Norquist, one of the great uh, researchers in longleaf, who initially 
developed the, who, who did some of the numerical work on how much diversity was in a longleaf forest, and I quoted her extensively, and I, and Carrie would say, oh, well, we were working in this forest where we had 25 to 40 species per square meter. And I said, goodness gracious. And so I kept saying, this is 25 to 40 species in a longleaf forest per square meter. And Carrie one day stopped me and said, oh, by the way, we were doing that work in a slash pine forest. <laughs> it melded into a longleaf forest, but slash pine had some interesting roles to play. Uh, in, in these coastal areas uh, and in brackish areas. Zuni. When we did our book, we were determined to go to every type of longleaf forest we could find. I don't think we quite succeeded, but we went to a lot of them. And so we went into the Zuni barrens, Zuni pine barrens, and that what they call it, in Virginia. And I'm looking around, and there ain't nothing but pond pine. Everywhere is pond pine. I'm thinking, where is the longleaf? Well, I find the old stumps of longleaf. They're still there. They tell the story. But you know, I think that forest was always composed of both pond pine and longleaf pine. So we forget that there's this incredible tree diversity within longleaf that's really important as well. Now, and, and shortleaf, I got to talk about shortleaf for a second. Uh, shortleaf is incredible, folks. It's incredible pine. And it carries the longleaf ecosystem into areas of the Piedmont, into areas of the mountains, where it wouldn't be without shortleaf. But I will also tell you, in every longleaf forest, there's great shortleaf. This, my friends, may look like a longleaf forest, but it is a shortleaf-dominated forest. In an area where, in central Alabama, where they said, God, we really want this to be longleaf. Help us make this to be longleaf. And they worked at it for 20 or 30 years. And I said, finally, Mark Bailey said to him, folks, you got a shortleaf forest. <laughs> we forget that there is this, it takes a village, it takes a community to create longleaf. And I'm not sure longleaf had the floor exclusively during all of this. Fire, what longleaf did really distinctly was to bring fire to all of these landscapes. And it did it better, I'm going to say, than any other tree. And this is really important. It certainly did it better than shortleaf, did it better than slash. Uh, and, and that fire was very important. You'll have to invite me back for another talk or get Julie to give that talk or somebody needs to talk about fire. But it brought it into wetland systems. So when I'm thinking about longleaf forest, I'm thinking about things like pond cypress. Of all things, in a longleaf forest, pond cypress is endemic. Julie, am I wrong? Pond cypress is endemic to longleaf. It's this incredible cypress that is known only from longleaf. There are tons of trees like that that are part of these wetland systems that we forget about, uh, nisses of all types. And things like, we had this great area in Alabama called the uh, Cahaba Glades. It was called the, the Lost World of the Cahaba Glades, where they found all these new species. And it was all because of these weird magnesium soils. And everybody said, oh, it's the magnesium soils. And everything is restricted to these magnesium soils and these little puddles. And you said, gosh, how did all of this diversity survive all of these years? And then we started burning. And as we cleared out under the longleaf, all of this diversity spread into the longleaf. That diversity, even in those small pools of prairies and glades that have unusual soils, in many cases, it exists because the longleaf forest helped to keep fire moving through those systems. They wouldn't have existed without it. Prairies across the southeast, you don't know what, you don't have many prairies here in North Carolina. You don't have enough limestone. Sorry. Alan Weekly says he gets lime, limestone sickness every time he comes to Alabama. But we have these incredible limestone areas and the, li and the limestone prairies. <coughs> are surrounded by pines and longleaf, and they conduct fire into those systems. Bamboo, I can't do a talk without talking about bamboo and how important it is to the southeast. Uh, we should talk more about that. There are now four species of bamboo in the southeast. There will probably be more by the time uh, the research is done. Uh, we're doing some really cool research on it. But bamboo is really important, and longleaf played a huge role in 
bringing this bamboo into our landscapes, the word Alabama itself is probably derived from the concept that the people of the South were keepers of the bamboo, keepers of the cane. Uh, the word Kusa means the white cane people, the white bamboo people. Uh, this was hugely important to North Carolina uh, throughout, the, throughout the state. Uh, all two species now in North Carolina, there, there may be more. And I got to talk about the diversity of time. I told you I was going to overwhelm you. Diversity of, diversity of place, diversity of seasons, diversity of time. Uh, and we have to start thinking about this just a little bit. That is the megafaunal diversity of the longleaf forest when people first came to the Carolinas. It was astonishing. It was amazing, and I, it doesn't even begin to capture it. We lost that, and we have to think about that. Now, it's interesting, at the peak of that megafaunal diversity, longleaf forests probably weren't as extensive as they are now. So this leads to some very interesting questions about longleaf. Once we lost, I mean, what? You got elephants running through the woods. <laughs> By golly, imagine what that would look like with elephants running through it. Imagine what it would look like with horses running through it. Imagine this is where horses and camels evolved and spread to the rest of the globe. We lost this. So we have to understand the loss of that diversity if we're going to understand how to manage longleaf. I'm beginning to think about that more and more. And we also begin to understand what longleaf did that was very special uh, after the loss of that. Um, another thing we have to think about, which is very important in understanding where you are in the south and longleaf, is this thing called glaciers. And that little black outline there is, is Ohio, because I first did this talk in Cincinnati, sorry. But just north of Cincinnati, it was glaciers. You know what lives under a glacier? Nothing. You know what was in the mountains of North Carolina on the tops of the mountains? Tundra and boreal forest. Where did all those species go? And we keep saying, oh, the glaciers pushed all this stuff down. Well, no, they didn't. <laughs> it was always here. They just wiped out everything where they were. So the South, it's important to understand, has always been, I'll show you this other map. That was done by the Dell Courts. It's fun to talk about. It's a map showing ecosystems during the peak of the last glaciation. The south in the Carolinas, maybe on the fringe up to, up to Long Island, maybe, but probably not. But from the Carolinas down through the middle of Florida and over along the Gulf Coast to the Mississippi River embayment was the warehouse for diversity. And so every time we went through <laughs> catastrophic warming, all that warehouse got re-released and moved northward. That's the important thing to understand. We are in the midst of catastrophic warming again at a new level. I want you to think about what this warehouse means and what longleaf diversity means as climate changes yet again. I like to think, what was longleaf like 20,000 years ago? Its species are ancient. This is, I just want you to think about this. Its species are ancient, but it may be a relatively new ecosystem. This was stunning to me when I first realized this based on some of the work that's coming out. But here's the cool thing. The question we should ask, did, did Longleaf and other fire-maintained savanna forest reassemble and save species that would have been lost when we lost the megafauna to climate and other things. Really, really important question. But what I can tell you is, is that the heat tolerance, the high diversity within longleaf, 
and within other savanna systems and within the temperate and within the deciduous forest in the south broadly speaking that is the future of the forest of new england that is the future of the forest of canada and we have to think about that it is an incredible asset we have and something we have to think about that this forest is more important to the country than it is to us and I got to talk about this other thing. Genetic diversity. So we have decided <laughs> uh, as if, as if, okay, how, how am I going to say this politely? As if God created species. When Genesis itself, by the way, folks, says God didn't create species, Genesis itself, go read it. Genesis chapter 2. It says in Genesis chapter 2, you folks got to come up with a name for all this stuff. That's your job. We are terrible at coming up with names for things. So we have this species concept that is really not very good and really doesn't capture what's going on in the world. Oh, God help us with common names. I mean, it's like everything is Joe Billy, which was my dad's name for every horse we ever had. <laughs> So it's like we don't have any common names. And even our Latin names, even our species concepts, don't sufficiently describe what's going on. So let's think about that. Let's think about that longleaf forest. Let's think about the fact that it is composed of these ancient species that have always been here, that some of those species moved northward during climate change. But where did the real genetic diversity within species occur. And this is the thing we don't think about. So I was going through the gardens, going through the campus today, and I smelled Father Gilla. It's really nice. I love it. It's a, it's a beautiful plant. And we, we thought all that was one species. Now we know that there, I don't know how many, we're going to probably end up with so many species of Father Gilla. It's ridiculous. And they're all genetically distinct. And you don't know, by the way, that the father gillas you planted here are even native to North Carolina. Because we decided, oh, well, our father is all, all one species. No, it isn't. We haven't done a really good job of naming those species. So there's a lot of genetic diversity that we don't consider. And that's why we created a research center in where I'm working now to begin looking at not just this huge deciduous forest diversity. We're studying every tree over 60 hectares, 150 acres. We have, we'll have about 100,000 stems. Every stem larger than a pencil will be, uh, we'll map it, we'll measure it, we'll identify it, and we'll follow it for 50 years. But what we're finding as we do this is that there is great variation within species. And this is something that's already been done in other forest dynamics plots in the tropics. We're beginning to understand that here. And what does that mean for longleaf? What does that mean for longleaf? I'm going to come back. Because let me tell you a story about elms. Sorry, I have to talk about elms for just a second. You know, everybody knows that Dutch elm disease wiped out American elm Right? Wrong. <laughs> You've been reading stuff written in Boston. Go look in the woods. From the Carolinas down into Florida, all the way across Alabama into Tennessee, there are millions of American elms. They're perfectly healthy. <laughs> now, all the research on American elms was done in Pennsylvania. <laughs> and at Harvard, and in New England, and no one even considered the American elms, and it was just, it was just absurd. It was about a decade or two ago, somebody noticed an elm that was surviving in the Arboretum uh, in, um, in Washington, D.C., at the National Arboretum, and said, God, that's a really, so they checked it out and said, why is this tree surviving? And it turned out to be, I got to say this, it was a triploid. It, was a, it, it had three, it had an extra set of chromosomes that it shouldn't have. And they suddenly realized, uh-oh, because plants can do this. If this happens, 
something funny is going on out there. And so they decided to start sampling American elms. And suddenly somebody realized, gosh, all these American elms are still alive in the Cumberlands. They're still alive in the Carolina Sandhills. What in the world is going on? And we now know, as Alan Weekly says, that we have at least two species of American elms and maybe more. And the two species we know are different, and they have yet to be named, have been separated for 11 million years. <laughs> Astonishing. And the cool thing is, they're disease resistant. You move them up north, they're fine. Uh, I could go into the reasons why it would be really fun, but, but I, I'm not going to overwhelm you too much. So what does that mean when we're developing a new generation of longleaf seedlings? This is something we had to think about very hard when we're, we were doing short leaf. Turned out that the short leaf pines that were being planted in eastern North America, this irritates the stew out of me. Every seedling was coming from Arkansas. Now, folks, Arkansas is a long way away. And it's separated by the Mississippi embayment. And if you don't think those short leaf in Arkansas aren't different from the short leaf in the Carolinas, you got something coming. <laughs> They were chemically different. They were more likely to hybridize with loblolly. And as we continued to introduce those Arkansas seedlings, they were wrecking the diversity of shortleaf in eastern North America. What if, what if, what if the same thing were going on with longleaf? Because we ain't thinking about that. We're growing it, producing it. We're moving it all around. Your longleaf in North Carolina is distinct. We've got some people at University of Georgia who are working on that now. Just something to think about. Diversity within species, really important. Why is longleaf diversity any, important anyway? Uh, this is, I guess I'm tipping over into another talk, but these are ticks, by the way, <laughs> on somebody's knee. An interesting thing, as we study trees in the tropics, and I'm going to try to be as brief as I can, what we're understanding is that diversity is driven by, in many ways, pathogens. It, the old name for it was the Red Queen hypothesis. You've got to keep on running to stay in one place, which is what the Red Queen said to Alice. You've got to keep running to stay in one place. And the pathogens are invading these trees, so they have to diversify and pathogens actually limit the distribution of some trees, which allows other trees to come in. It's a really interesting thing. But the pathogens don't stop. I, we should have a whole talk on pathogens. But let's talk about how diversity reckons with pathogens and why, as you get into a long growing season and a warmer area, diversity becomes really important. So it's a great study done in Europe. And they were looking at the chances that certain forest types would harbor ticks and harbor tick diseases. And it turns out the least diverse forest had the most ticks generally. But more importantly, the least diverse forest had the greatest incidence of tick diseases. And that's because of vectors and other things. It was really cool. Now, it, longleaf is kind of nice. We all love working in longleaf because, one, we burn it, and it gets rid of the ticks. <laughs> you got a problem with ticks? Fire. It'll, work, it'll solve it for you. You got a problem with chiggers? Fire. It's great. Uh, not every forest can be burnt. But the more diverse that forest and the more diverse the creatures in that forest, Plants, or just even the plant diversity, tended to lower the incidence of disease. And this is a paradigm, something we need to think about. Diversity actually is, is our way of reckoning with, OK, is it going to go? There we go. Climate. Diversity is our choice for the future. It's our choice now. We haven't made good choices. We haven't even begun to even explore what, what longleaf and its species can do for us. But I will tell you that when I think about longleaf, I think what obscure plant in that longleaf forest is going to become a cornerstone for the forest of the future. Because things are changing rapidly. 
We don't know what's going to survive. We don't even know that climate is going to be the biggest obstacle of these forests yet. It's probably going to be a big one. Diversity is our, our option for the future. I will also tell you diversity in longleaf forest, this is really important. If you want carbon capture, we're now understanding that the more layers of diversity you have in the vascular plant community, the generally the better your carbon capture. And we're now getting some good studies to do that. So uh, pine forest with a grass understory may be one of the best carbon capture systems that we have now. Interesting, interesting thing. Uh, single species management, I don't want to talk about it. We've got to talk about the equitable forest, a forest that welcomes people. This is the problem. Longleaf will be a labor of love going forward. Diversity will be a labor of love, and we got to have the labor. We got to have the brains, we got to have the hands. In the past, we weren't very equitable when it came to exploiting the longleaf forest. The exploitation of the longleaf forest went hand in hand with the exploitation of people. The lumbi were hugely important in, in the management of the tar pits in North Carolina. The Lumbee moved their expertise with tar pits southward. They don't get a lot of credit, but they moved through Georgia and even into northwest Florida and, and into Alabama with their experience, but they were exploited the whole way. Uh, the people who cut those trees were exploited. We can't afford this in the future. We can't afford this in the future if we're going to work with longleaf. Every creature, every individual, Every person is going to matter if we're going to manage this new longleaf forest. We need the hands. We need the people. We need the minds. And the South has not done a great job of training all minds to understand natural history. And that's why we don't understand our own natural history. <laughs> Everybody in the South needs to be trained in natural history and in the importance of what's here. And so we need these programs that bring in people that weren't included at, at, at earlier stages of our history, of every type. And I, I want to say, this is what's really cool. The Lumbee, the Moas, the Choctaws, the Porch Indians, and this is the Alabama Cushata. These are all tribes that were in the middle of the Longleaf Range. All of them are in various ways involved in restoring longleaf. And we don't think about their relationship with longleaf when we talk about it. We need to talk about it more. But they're back on it. This is really great to see. And uh, I, I just wanted uh, Egon, Egon, Ye, Egon Ye Folicia. Uh This is the name of a deliberate community that is being created in the middle of longleaf to restore the longleaf ecosystem. They've got bison now. Uh, in the middle of Alabama at Flag Mountain, where the, uh, where the Blue Ridge and Longleaf intersect. Really cool. So there are some great things, but we have a new opportunity to bring everyone into the Longleaf story, and we need to be doing that. Diversity of Longleaf. It's an inclusive ecosystem. It's a system that if we're going to save, we're going to have to do it equitably. Those words seem familiar. If they do, maybe we can use Longleaf to help us sort out some of our human issues as well. All right, I talked too long. <laughs> Bill, thank you so much. I'll bring a little bit of light to the subject. We have time for about one or two questions in the room or on Zoom. And we have one right here. And David, we're good to go with the overhead uh, microphone. It just projects. So I, I heard that the talk from Stuart Driver who said that in a spoonful of soil, there's more diversity than 
all the species known to mankind. And I was wondering what is known about the soil conditions in uh, longleaf pine forests? Are they different? Are they more? Yes. To the... So you wanted me, I talked to go on for two hours, didn't you? Exactly. So, uh, so questions about soil diversity in longleaf, and it is soil in longleaf is, <laughs> It depends on the community. And, but one of the things we know about uh, longleaf forests is that in many cases, because of fire, there is no, there's not a conventional topsoil layer. It's a very different sort of soil system. Ed Wilson said that 80% of, we, we don't know 80% of species. Uh, it's probably as right as anything. And most of, many of those species are in the soil. Uh, there's, you know, we could look at a typical um, deciduous forest and we might have 10 or 20,000 species in a small area of forest. We can't even comprehend knowing all those. What we do know about longleaf is, is that it is very distinctive, as many savanna systems are, because it doesn't develop topsoil as readily. And, and, the, and the topsoil and the chemistry of that soil, and thus the creatures of that soil, depend on something called hard carbon, black carbon, it's charcoal, and that charcoal becomes the, um, what do I say, sort of the, the pillar around which all the chemistry and the activity of that soil revolves, and it's really important. So it is very distinctive. What do we know about what's in those soils? Nothing. <laughs> it's pitiful. It's one of the things we hope to understand in this deciduous forest we're studying, but well, we got a lot of work to do with that leaf.